And the following day, John Hancock, President of Congress, sends out 13 official copies to all 13 colonies, ordering us all to print it. So the official copy shows up in Boston on the 15th of July. Here's the one that was printed in uh, Philadelphia. Most people will see the movie National Treasure. Anybody ever see that movie? That handwritten document. Uh, the handwritten one was actually done three weeks after this. It was almost like they're sitting around going, you know, we should do a nice one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all sign it. Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. So that one they carried around with them. I didn't leave their, their hands. Uh, but this one, uh, this is different. So this goes to all 13 colonies with a letter from Hancock or in Fisher copy shows up in Boston on the 15th of July. John Gill sets it in type and prints it. It's printed for two editions uh, in July of 1776, and then it virtually disappears from history. The printing press itself, this is essentially what Gutenberg invented in Germany in 1450. It doesn't change for 350 years. Every book, Bible, proclamation that's printed from 1450 until 1800 is done on a wooden press like this. This is what we call it. He should be working by now. He could be working by now. Yeah, he might be strong enough, but if you got up on a chair, no, he can sell type. The youngest printer I know is seven years old. Is that right? Yep, Isaiah Thomas. Um, he's a Patriot printer when he starts the Massachusetts Spy in 1770. He's 23 years old. There's a Boston edition of the Declaration of Independence. When I printed this last July 3rd on my press, I was the first one to print this in 236 years. Nobody had ever recreated this declaration. And the only reason I can imagine why is because it was so obscure and nobody knew it existed. Because, you know, it's a declaration printed in the city where the rebellion begins and where the war breaks out. You would think that would have some value in a centennial or a bicentennial celebration, but nobody ever reprints it. In fact, I have studied Boston printing for about 10 years. I was not aware of its existence until three years ago when some of these auctions went on. Now, I assumed it was a Dunlap broadside from Philadelphia that they were offering. It was this. And so, Austin, edition of the Declaration, what? That's when I found out the story that all colonies printed them. So, um, it's pretty rare. That one auctioned off for about $800,000. I'm selling mine for a little bit less than that. <laughs> I do sell them all rolled up in the boots across the hallway that have in the last couple of days. But so, it's was a there a standard font that was used, or was it a special yep. font used for decorations like nope. this? Nope. Um, the font typically used in the American colonies uh, in the 1770s was William Caslon. So you still have Caslon on modern computers. It's a little bit different than this. This is old style Caslon. In fact, when I, when I found the original document, um, my modern types were just a little bit larger. I was going to hand set this. Uh, but when I found out through the measurements of the original document that my types would work because modern types were a different size than the century types, um, I had to have all 9,000 letters cast. Um, so, I can't have cheap. No, it wasn't. <laughs> about $2,000, and that was a deal. Um, the guy doesn't do it commercially. He's about 80 years old. lives in West Virginia. So how long would it take to hand set the print for that? Wow. These are the letters. There's 9,000 of these in the letters. Oh, no. How many of those casts using lead? Wood? No, lead. No, I know, but what was the... Oh, no, it's a matrices. Um, you, uh, let's see if I have one here. Yeah, right there. So this is from a modern monotype machine. See the letters? Yeah. It's run on an X and Y axis. Like this. Squirts lead, pops it up, and a few sentences. It was invented in 1880s, one of the most sophisticated machines ever invented. Until they invent the line of machine, the next iteration of it, mm -hmm. that's way more sophisticated. So, do some of the words, like common words like the or and, come already? No, nope, no. Nope. Here's my type cases over here. So, uh, when you guys type, you go like this. Most of you with your thumbs, right? Mm -hmm. When I type, I come to my type cases. So, I've got an uppercase with my capital letters in it, my lowercase with my lowercase letters in it. Anybody ever heard of the term uppercase and lowercase? Yeah. Well, it comes well, it's a physical reality. Yeah. And so you have to memorize the case. It's not A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The most commonly used characters are here in the center. So whenever you're setting type, I'm doing that one column broadside of the declaration. I, I, do a, I get a large composing stick, and I begin setting letters. This gets really heavy when it's full of lead. 
because this is made from lead, tin, and antimony, mostly lead. So when we're doing newspapers, we're really doing those. Um, you can see this is a one-to-one -one copy of the Boston Gazette in small columns. So I'll set this smaller composing stick to a small column size. The only thing holding this type in there right now is my thumb. And that's pretty much the way it goes. They're not magnetic. They don't slide into any kind of little locking mechanism. Um, so, <clears throat> and they're upside down and backwards. <laughs> when I pick letters out, I'm not looking at the letters. I just hope my apprentices put the right letter in the right box. That's where you guys come in. So I, every piece of type has a nick at the bottom of it. That nick tells me it's the front and bottom of the character. So when I reach my hand in the E box, I just feel for the nick. If I'm doing T-H-E, T-H-E. It's -E. always space to turn. I have a space bar, except it's an individual piece of lead with no letter on it, in varying thicknesses. Because we have to justify these lines as well, manually. So I'm justifying by the spaces I put in them. And that's the printer's eye that says, okay, I need this. And you just make them fit snug in the case here. And the spaces go down to as thin as something like a piece of copper. I mean, I, I use these frequently to just tighten up the line. Wow. It's a shim. But if I don't shim it and one of these letters are loose, what I do next, after I get, so I start building paragraphs into a column and a galley. Once I get the whole galley set, the whole page done, I slide all the type off on one of these stones and I lock it up into a rectangular frame. See that? There's no bottom on this. So if any one of those letters are loose, I didn't shim a letter, and I pick it up, they all fall out. Those hours of work are wasted. That's bad. Not only those hours, then you got to look at every letter and put them back in the case. Apprentices don't like doing that. So um, it's a lot of work. And you can imagine what that was like with 95 pounds of lead. So just last week, I picked up this 95-pound form, hoping none of the letters were loose, and laid it down. Yeah. So, but it works. 